He's been described as a fiery bigot by many, by others he's loved as a saint. To me, he's warm, loving, kind and generous, and I count it an honour to welcome my father, the big man himself, Ian Paisley. Yeah. Roma Catholics would have had pictures of the Pope on the walls of their homes. Some of us had pictures of Ian Paisley. If you never get tired walking backwards. There was only one Moses, there was only one Elijah, there was only one Elisha. And Ian Paisley, he was in that mold too. Let's preach this message! Accept the man! Be born again! He cannot see the kingdom of God. Ever! Ever! He was saying all the things that I, as a young loyalist, wanted to hear. He has stirred the Protestants up against the Catholics. He certainly used sectarian bigotry as a way to achieve power. If you're reared on a diet of no surrender, how do you negotiate positively? <laughs> Just shut up. Just shut yeah. up. There are some names, aren't there, which take on an almost a magical quality. Paisley certainly one of them. Good lad. Green Paisley Jr. being primed to take over his father's role. He saw himself as having a destiny. He was an arsonist who joined the fire brigade for the last few years of his life. For 40 years, Martyrs Memorial Church in Belfast was Ian Paisley's spiritual home. This stadium of preaching echoed with his thunderous voice. We hear the siren cry of the ecumenical movement, and we can see the plots and the planning and the purposes. As he delivered a message as inspiring as it was uncompromising. This church condemn all subversive acts. Marian religion and political conviction with passionate zeal. This is not a battle between mere political parties. This unique combination made him one of the most loved and hated figures of his generation, whose legacy still lives on today. And trying to understand the phenomenon that became Ian Paisley you have to realize that the 50s and 60s in Northern Ireland are a world away from where we are today. Religion was very important when I was growing up. A Sunday was for church. It was just an intrinsic part of Northern Ireland society. Ian Paisley was raised in a devoutly Christian home in Northern Ireland's deeply religious heartland. As children, we wouldn't have played in the street on a Sunday. We had friends come over from England when we were children and they wanted to go out to play. We were horrified. You know, how can you go out to play on a Sunday? The son of a maverick preacher, Paisley found God at the age of six. I was brought up in the historic Christian faith to believe this Bible to be the word of God and the sole rule of faith and practice. And I received Christ and uh, by receiving him, I became a new creature. I was born again in biblical language. I'm not going to heaven because I have been baptized or because I take communion or because I preach or because I try to live up to the standard of Christianity. I'm going to heaven simply by the grace of God. His faith was never something he kept in the cupboard. He would have taken any opportunity, whether it was friend or foe, to tell them the gospel. That was what was his driving ambition. Paisley had, in theological terms, a very simplistic take on all of humanity. Everyone was created, but there were some who were created for salvation, and there were some who were destined to damnation. Paisley didn't care whichever church you were part of, in terms of your salvation, the only question was, what was your relationship with God? Paisley rejected the mainstream Protestant churches, who he felt had compromised their faith. And so, aged only 25, he founded his own. 
the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster. This is someone who started preaching when he was a teenager. From that earliest age, he needed to be the leader, not the follower. The folk who are standing around the side, would you please move up? I still remember my first encounter with Ian Paisley. He had a mesmerizing power to just bubble with passion in front of people and get them animated, get them energized. I saw it happening. Even as a small child, I remember thinking, wow. If you have your Bible or Testament with you. Ian Paisley was a leader in search of a following, a sidelined prophet looking for an audience to match his unremitting confidence and brash certainties. And whether you be a Protestant or a Romanist, whether you be a Jew, or belong to any other religion. It matters not. You were born naturally as a child of wrath. Paisley was like a creature from another age, from another century. That fundamentalist, tub thumping sort of preaching down, and that's what the crowds wanted. The first time that I was privileged to hear Dr. Paisley preach, it was a man talking to the God of heaven, and the singing was wholehearted. It really did leave that deep impression upon my heart. Paisley's direct, charismatic style of preaching soon reached beyond the countryside and into the city. What do you think of he's him? Huh? Why do you think he's a good man? Well, it's, I couldn't tell you. Yes, they have my two sons. What did he save them from? Oh, well, one went to dances and one went to bookies. I see. And you think that's evil, do you? I think it is very evil. I was a rebellious teenager. I'd lost my license through drunken driving. I was just a fool. My mother used to say to me, come down with us, we're going to hear Dr. Paisley. I thought, if I become a Christian, that means the end of all the, the dances, the boozing and everything. No, I, I couldn't have that. And as soon as I made that wee decision, I was frightened. What if God would never speak to me again? So the following Sabbath evening, the routine, we're going down to hear Dr. Paisley, would you like to come? And I said, yes, I'd love to come. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that night he preached and I was thrilled to hear the message. And at the end he made an appeal. There is no one who could make an appeal again, Paisley. And he said, anybody would like to know how to be saved, put your hand up. And my hand was up. And so I began my life as a free Presbyterian. We'll stand to sing, and let's really sing it with all our hearts, everyone. Oh, Paisley provided not just with an alternative theology, a salvationist theology, the sort of hellfire preacher, Paisley gave a voice to the fundamentalist. Sing it on. There's wonderful power in the Everyone there. In the moral revolution of the post-war years, Ian Paisley saw himself as the voice of a radically conservative culture. Conservative thinking is not so much what you support, what you uh, are in favour of, but what you are against. And we as Protestants will never confess Roman Catholic dogma. And the cross, and the cross, yeah. Ian Paisley succeeds through the demonization of others. He needs to point to them and say, they are taking you to hell in a handcart. Come with me. Uh, there's a boat leaving. It's the rescue ship for salvation. And that was the strategy. Paisley's contempt for the counterculture was surpassed only by his scorn for the Catholic Church, an institution he believed to be destined for damnation. 
Paisley's battle cry is no truck with popery. At one rally last weekend, he raised an embarrassed laugh by calling the Pope old Mr. Red Sox, and he attacked the Archbishop of Canterbury's recent visit to Rome. And they've all been busy slobbering on a slipper. <laughs> and of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he's got a bit higher. He kisses them now. <laughs> they have a good hug, the both of them. The pity hadn't kept them in his embrace. This man was going around calling the Pope the Antichrist. He was talking about Catholic women as, what did he call them, incubators for Rome. I mean, Paisley was never a man who was lost for a phrase. Paisley was a flavour of Protestant that we were not used to. Why are you so but, afraid uh, of popery? I'm Paisley. not afraid of popery at all, but I do not like and I detest priestcraft. I believe in liberty. I have seen the results of popery on the continent. It's the breeder of communism, and I'm opposed to it. Dr Paisley, what do you yeah. say to The me? things that Dr Paisley said were very inflammatory, and I think if you were a Roman Catholic, you would have taken great offence. In those days, you respected the colour, and it didn't matter what religion you were, you still respected that clerical colour. Do you not sometimes to go out of your way to antagonise? Well, it, it is my duty, my bounden duty, uh, to cry aloud, as the scripture says, and spare not. But let me say, the, the prophets were shocking. Ian Paisley knew courting scandal could help him reach larger audiences and extend his pulpit. Paisley was all about power, and power meant that you had to play the media, and by God, he knew about getting his face on the nine o'clock news or on the front page of the paper. This flirtation with controversy was never more explicit than in the case of Maura Lyons. The story of Maura Lyons is one of the most bizarre stories. This was a young girl, 15 years old, from West Belfast. She converts from Catholicism, her family's faith, to Protestantism. When she told her parents, and their parents got very upset, that they felt she'd been under pressure, they were going to invite the priests in to have a conversation with her, she escapes out the window of the house. And she was taken away through different contacts within the Free Presbyterian Church. Was Paisley involved? It becomes a cause celeb. She realised when she went home she was going to have a very rough time and she left the country. And I did not know where Myra Lance was, nor did I want to know where she was. Paisley then says that he's going to call a big meeting at the Ulster Hall. Maybe more Alliance is going to make an appearance. But it's instead a tape recording of her voice is played to the gathered crowds in which she gives her testimony, her religious conversion story. Where did this tape recording come from? Well, the Paisleys say that one day they open the door and the tape recording is sitting there behind the milk bottles. Ian Paisley was really, really very, very careful to say and make it clear, I have nothing to do with Moore Lyons' disappearance. Well, nobody can point the finger at what was happening in the Moore Lyons case. She came home and the courts of the country declared she could be a Protestant. Uh, and that was the end of the story. Can you imagine this happening today? But that was the kind of absolutely extraordinary headline-grabbing story that launched Ian Paisley as a household name across Northern Ireland. In Ulster Television, where I worked, the lads I worked with were all Roman Catholics. They gave me an education on Ian Paisley and what a villain he was. I brought a wafer with me. <laughs> and how wrong he was in his views. He was a bigot. These people say it's a shame to bring this biscuit here. I said, what are you talking about? That's bunkum. I was a roaring Paisleyite. I want to say that this wafer, after it is consecrated, the Church of Rome teaches 
is the actual body, bones, blood, earth, fingers, and deity of Jesus Christ. It was the power of religion which created Northern Ireland, and it's the power of religion which has been threatening ever since to tear the country in half. Here a man is either a Protestant or a Catholic. He is either with us or with them. Why is it so difficult for boys like you on the Protestant side to meet and make friends with boys on the Catholic side? Because they don't want to make friends with us. Well, do you want to make friends with them? No. You can't trust them. Traditional religious enmity between Protestants and Catholics was echoed across society, encompassing jobs, opportunities and politics. When I went to university, quite a lot of the students were from the North, and they used to talk about, you know, the awful times the Catholics had in the North, and I used to think, like, this is exaggeration, this could not be true. To the Catholics, the Protestants appear as a kind of self-imposed master race, which maintains itself in undue power by gerrymandering critical local elections and by sustaining a police state. The awful thing was the discrimination. People couldn't get jobs. People would tell you, there's no point in going for the job because once they ask you where you were at school, that's the end of it. I'm from a Republican family and I lived just off the Falls Road with my granny. That gave me an insight into the poverty, the division, the, you know. If you treat people as if they were nothing, if hatred gets in the way of it all, then you end up with calamity after calamity. I just remember thinking, God, something has to be done. And it is the intention of Rome to rob the Protestants of their rights. Against the backdrop of increasing Catholic unrest, Ian Paisley became a prominent Protestant figurehead. A number of organizations had been started by Paisley. Some of them were quite sort of clear, you know, to keep Protestants in employment and preference to Catholics. Paisley began printing his own newspaper, the Protestant Telegraph, regularly promoting anti-Catholic propaganda. He also established a paramilitary-style organization, the Ulster Protestant Volunteers. There was always that veiled threat. There was always the understanding that there was a line of sectarianism that underlay this, which was quite dangerous. And at volatile times in Northern Ireland, who knows whether it did or didn't lead to actions against Catholics. This is no time for compromise. I ask you today, are you going to stand for Ulster? Are you going to defend your heritage? Are you going... Of course he knew the power of his words. If you are, I ask you to raise your right hand to heaven now with me. Let me see your hands. Every man and every woman dedicated to the cause of Ulster. It is very easy to understand in the atmosphere of the 1960s when you have an Ian Paisley in the middle inflaming, I mean, the right to a vote at local government election, jeepers. Could they have been frightened or provoked easily? Paisley took his pulpit onto the streets, leading a protest through a Catholic stronghold, where no Protestant march had passed for over 30 years. I was in company with Dr. Paisley. I was a student minister. I remember when we crested the, the, the hill uh, on the bridge and looked down, we could see there was quite a kerfuffle going on. But as we were going through a hail of everything came down, those railway bolts and bricks, and I remember looking up and it was like looking into a snowstorm. Where three Presbyterians, led by the Reverend Ian Paisley, were attacked. When police demanded their dispersal, threatening arrests, Paisley and his followers refused to back down, choosing to suffer for their beliefs. 
Are you going to take any steps to avoid violence at your meetings now, Mr. Payne? There never was any violence uh, at our meetings. Never any violence. Our people are not a violent people. The people who started the trouble were the Roman Catholics and Republicans, sir, of Cromick Square. We didn't return the missiles. We're not responsible for the violence. The violence comes from the Roman Catholic Church. I think it was a stunt that he could put his name to and gain support from. He's done that all his life. I mean, it's a, it's a constant punch and Judy show. Well, the word went out. Those men have got to be punished for that. And we were found guilty. Do you see yourself as a martyr now, Mr. Paisley? I don't see myself as a martyr at all. I see myself uh, as a Christian minister who's not prepared to sell his conscience to any politician or to any prime minister. Prime Minister, can we ask you if you think that the Reverend Paisley is a threat to peace in Ulster? Well, uh, his uh, activities don't exactly lead to harmony, shall we put it that way? So, after a few days, we were taken to Crumlin Road. We had a farewell meeting in the Ulster Hall, and Dr. Paisley, <laughs> as only he could, invited the police, well, come now and arrest us. I can remember elderly Christian ladies shedding bitter tears over me, young man, you're going to jail, your life will be ruined. <laughs> and to me, it was, I'm going to Butlins. What are you talking about? This is a great adventure. For Paisley, incarceration proved to be significant. His legend among Protestants was sealed. An outsider, persecuted by the establishment, and a martyr embodying courage and faithfulness. When my father heard about it, he said, that's a courageous man. That man is being persecuted for his faith. And so he asked the Bob Jones University Board of Trustees for permission to confer an honorary degree on Dr. Paisley while he was in prison. He is coming again. He is coming again. With power and grace. Bob Jones Jr., a former Shakespearean actor, was from a family of American preachers and the president of the family business a fundamentalist university in South Carolina. When you set out to be a disciple of Christ, you know that you're going to be marginalized, despised, and rejected. My dad was always for the underdog, and so he was proud to be identified with a jailbird. We got out early in the morning. Um, we had a welcome home meeting. The police did everything to stop the people attending. They banned buses being used to bring the people to the field. But even so, some 25,000 people gathered in the open air. Dr. Bob Jones was over from America for this big welcome home rally. I'm a free-born Protestant, and all the intimidation, and all the slander, and all the lying about me will not stop me in my campaign in Ulster to keep Ulster out of the south of Ireland. Admiration for Paisley grew. The unaccredited honorary degree granted him a new title, Dr. Paisley. First time I saw you walk on by, you So hold on, baby. And he became an international fundamentalist figure. Dr. Paisley, we welcome you to the United States of America. He was in many pulpits across America as a result of my father's friendship. I felt when I was around him that I was kind of in the presence of a modern-day prophet. In Northern Ireland, Ian Paisley's unwavering convictions had placed him as a growing political voice for neglected unionists. As well as firing off the gospel cannon at the churches, it was necessary to answer what was being said in the political realm. He had this black and white, right and wrong approach to both religion and politics. So when he sensed compromise, that to him marked those people as people who were on the damned side, not the safe side. 
an attempt to change the climate in which Catholics live is being made by the new Prime Minister of Captain Terence O'Neill, here visiting a Catholic convent girls' school. I thought I was going to see a girl at one moment. <laughs> Radical moves, such as increasing financial support for Catholics and improving relations with the Republic of Ireland, were being made by the government. To Ian Paisley, this was the sin of compromising with Ulster's enemies and therefore had to be stopped. The ruling Unionist Party had been unchallenged since the country's creation. But Paisley and his wife Eileen a newly elected Belfast city councillor, were determined to change that. They set their sights on the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, Terence O'Neill. Captain O'Neill recently said that the south of Ireland was a very beautiful young lady and that he was very glad to talk to her over the head. Of course, Captain O'Neill's a married man and he shouldn't be talking over the hedge to any young ladies. We look upon the south of Ireland as the refuge for the murderers of policemen and law enforcement officers and Protestants who will not bow the knee to the Romish field. His tactics were basically to attack and criticise those in office for failing to put forward a sufficiently robust defence of unionism. I would have been supportive of Terence O'Neill, but then I began to think this man is too soft. The only way was to, to respond through negotiation and discussion and reform, and uh, we just felt that's not the way to respond to this. My grandfather, who was a working man, he was very concerned that I would go down the Paisley route and he remember him telling me, you know, don't do that, son, he says, because he'll wreck and destroy on the basis that you can't split the vote. United we stand, divided we fall, but what's the point in being united if the whole thing is going to collapse down around us? Do you think that Paisley should be taken seriously? Paisley should be taken, taken very, very seriously. The biggest crime that Paisley has committed, the cardinal sin which he has committed, is by saying in public what a lot of other unionists think in private. If at any time there was a doubt in the mind of those who had present support the government that their position was not as secure as it should be, they then, and this is the danger, they could certainly throw in their wit with the Paisley element. Paisley knew O'Neill was out of touch with the Protestant working classes with whom for some years his own populist style had resonated. As the Ulster, where the loyalists shall walk, they shall walk with my kindred. Bringing his preaching onto the streets, Paisley campaigned for the support of loyalists. When Paisley came along, it was a new breath of fresh air to the working class unionist people. We deemed him as working class because of the fact that he was down there talking to us. Captain O'Neill represents himself as the Cassius Clay of the Unionist Party, the greatest ever Prime Minister of Ulster. This, of course, is utter rubbish and nonsense. You know, everything that came out of his mouth, we agreed with. He was saying all the things that I, as a young loyalist, wanted to hear. Captain O'Neill has succeeded in doing what no other enemy of Ulster has been able to do, to divide drastically the Loyalist and Protestant community. The Unionist party that we had, they only had to go out with a drum, Union Jack and a bond, and, and, and that would get them into their seats. It's fair to say that in those days, unionism tended to have leadership, which was, I could press say it as being big house unionism. I know when I started off in, in politics in East Belfast looking at the dreadful housing conditions that existed, there was undoubtedly a pool of people there who to some extent had been taken for granted and were left without a voice. Ian saw an opportunity. In the coming 10 days, you're going to hear the marching feet of Protestants on the march. <laughs> He was very, very good at bringing the crowd up to support what he believed in. But Captain O'Neill doesn't mind whether he splits the Unionist Party or not. 
He has done that already. He doesn't mind whether he spits the country or not. He's done that already. All that Captain O'Neill is interested in is Captain O'Neill. If anyone's played football and they've scored a hat trick, and um, after you score that hat trick, the euphoria is in you, and it's yes, well done, yes. Well, that's what it was like. Listen to uh, Dr. Paisley. Uh, it was listen to him. It was like go on, son. Go, that's exactly you're right. Him up. Him up. Him up. No surrender. He's a populist and he knows what ordinary people think and he appeals probably to their worst instincts. Populists always need a target and a hate figure. Influenced by surging social changes of the late 60s, activists in Northern Ireland stepped up campaigns demanding equal rights for all. O'Neill found himself caught between the increasingly powerful civil rights movement and Paisley's uncompromising resistance. And we will not have this part of the city desecrated by Republicans. Those that have cursed our flag, have cursed our queen, and are out to destroy our country. And I want to say that we are determined as ever to resist the Republicans. Every time there was reform, that was seen by loyalists as they were losing. I think the way to deal with that was for politicians to give leadership and to explain to their own people. In fact, it was an evening up, if you like. But instead, Paisley's way of dealing with it was to exploit the fears of the people who thought they were losing. If you're roared on a dad of we are the people. What we have, we hold. Not an inch. No surrender. How do you negotiate positively? <laughs> you know, how do you how do you try to find a space that that you know because it isn't what we have, we hold. You know. As a young lad in the end days, I, I was looking as a loyalist and a unionist and listening to the rhetoric from people who knew a lot better than what I did. And then the old saying, give him an inch, we'll take a mile. Police soon removed a roadblock formed by teenagers who threw bricks into the street to prevent police vehicles driving through. Soon after the obstruction had gone, a petrol bomb was thrown at a group of 15 policemen on a street corner. Violence erupted on the streets of Derry as civil rights marchers clashed with loyalist protesters. Paisley seized an opportunity to brand the movement as a front for the IRA. This was another uprising. There had been uprisings, as we know before, with, within the Republican movement and trying to create a united Ireland. The chairman of the civil rights organisation is a card-carrying communist uh, who is on record as being opposed to the constitution of Northern Ireland. Therefore, the whole civil rights association is a front movement uh, for the destruction of the Constitution of Northern Ireland. It has been alleged that this uh, civil rights association has been infiltrated by IRA and communists. Is that the situation? Northern Ireland politics are so peculiar that every time an election is mentioned in Northern Ireland, the IRA rears its head. Every time that any civil strife or people stand up for their rights, the IRA rears, uh, rears its head. This protest is a protest by the people of Derry. The IRA is not concerned. But do you think this violence is going to continue? Yes. Yes. yes, I'm afraid I think the violence is going to continue. We were in some dismay as to what was happening to our country that Ian Paisley quickly seemed to articulate the concerns that many of us felt. I don't believe it's a civil rights campaign because it's also covered by republicanism and by Roman Catholicism. This was a clear, full frontal assault on our people. You know, when you hear it like that, you're thinking, well, we better, we better stand up here, you know. I remember thinking the world's, the world's coming to an end. Mr. Paisley, there have been so many troubles in Ulster these last few weeks. Who's to blame? Well, I believe that in regard to the north of Ireland, the Roman Catholic Church has to bear the blame. 
Well, as far as I can see, it has been going on this month, this year, from Mr. Paisley came into the picture. He has stirred the Protestants up against the Catholics. For years, they lived in peace, but he couldn't have that, nor he wouldn't have it. I was very angry. I knew that unionists were afraid because of civil rights. He was the one who was exploiting all the fears of the unionists. And he kept telling them that they were in danger and that the union was in danger. And that kept them, in a way, subservient because he was going to be the savior. Where do we get on the bank? We have to a British city prepares for trouble on a cold, sunny Saturday morning. It could be some hysterical local football derby, but it isn't. This is Northern Ireland, and the expected conflict is political and religious. The civil rights movement upped the ante and organised their biggest march yet for Armagh city centre. Paisley retaliated, rallying loyalists from across the province with the intention of blocking the march. All shops closed for the day and barricade themselves as if the Huns were coming. Since dawn, Armagh's centre has been barricaded by police. Their searches of arriving cars have found over 200 scythes, billhooks and other weapons, and most sinister, some loaded revolvers. He encouraged loyalists to be there, armed with cudgels and stones, to stop the marches. Catholics knew that there were targets. You didn't have to be involved in anything. Paisley and his mob barricaded the city centre, daring the police and intimidating the marchers. I remember there was very, very palpable fear in Armagh at that time because the police would not take on the loyalists who were opposing the march because it would cause a riot. The police had no option but to stop the march. A victory for Paisley. These men who've taken the city centre are one extreme, the militant Protestants of Ulster. Their champion and oratorical leader is the Reverend Ian Paisley. I'd just like to say that the Protestants and Loyalists of uh, this province have demonstrated their willingness today to take their stand in defence of their heritage. And we have done violence to no man but we have sought by all constitutional means to defend what we believe is our right and our wonderful liberties which we have as Protestants. That's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you very much. You. And gentlemen... Watch out for your cameras, Paisley warns as he leaves us. This isn't a joke, any of it. It's not a juvenile demonstration. The mood is that of the 17th century, of the Counter-Reformation. Defense of Protestantism, which is the raison d'etre of Northern Ireland's existence. Ian was just the man to lead that charge, you know, surrender. Once we were just fearful that the IRA were going to destroy the country by bombs and bullets. And it gave us further reinforcement for feeling that we should never have given in to the reforms that were being demanded by the civil rights movement. This is BBC Northern Ireland. The Prime Minister of Northern Ireland Captain the Right Honourable Terence O'Neill. Ulster stands at the crossroads. We are on the brink of chaos where neighbour could be set uh, against neighbour. Protestant or Roman Catholic, Unionist or Nationalist, Disorder must now cease. The bully boy tactics we saw in our ma are no answer to these grave problems. You're seeing his dying kicks, the dying kicks of O'Neillism. Paisley intensified his campaign against O'Neill. He blamed him for political instability and escalating violence on the streets. As the country descended into civic breakdown, O'Neill had no choice but to resign. 
Dr. Paisley to me was a leader telling us that we needed to get ready for this attack from Republicans. People within the Loyalist and Unionist communities mobilised themselves. That's when it started to become real. You know, the fear of civil war was rife. I was uh, born and bred in the market area, inner city, Catholic working class district. My parents, the news was on, on the R in our house and the radio. So if, if there was a speech Paisley was making somewhere, you know, it was always apocalyptic and doom and gloom. They felt their community could be attacked. There was a fear of encirclement, that the area could be overwhelmed by Paisleyites and their supporters. And I think that he reinforced that. If he winds all these people up, they're gonna do something bad. In Belfast, Protestant mobs invaded Catholic areas of the city. When you fight fire with fire, you felt that you needed to do something to stop this. As a young lad, all the troubles really were exciting. It's a wee bit hard to explain whenever you're caught in situations that are dangerous. The adrenaline, is, 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 you know, is what keeps you going. God bless an Ulster at this time. Remove from us the tyrant who would seek to take away our liberties. I'm sure he would have denied that he was telling them to do anything, but the pulse was coming there, that rhetorical pulse, and some found it irresistible and wanted to act on it. And then how do you act on it? Do you pick up a gun? Do you pick up a Bible? Do you pick up both? While violent clashes continued on the streets, Paisley's reputation as a loyalist firebrand was boosted by the opening of his own specially commissioned Martyrs Memorial Church. This uh, building is not built because uh, the preacher wants a larger building or because the congregation wants an elaborate building. It's built uh, because of necessity. With a capacity of 1,500 worshippers, Martyrs Memorial was then one of Northern Ireland's biggest churches. The pulpit is this size for two reasons. Number one, it would be out of all proportion to the church if it was smaller. Number two, that I don't alone occupy the pulpit. Sometimes we will have difficulty in seating all the preachers that will be coming to take part in our conferences. When Martyrs opened, that was a significant event for Free Presbyterians everywhere. And they came from England, from south of the border and everywhere else to rejoice with Ian Paisley. You had to be there at six o'clock to get a seat for the seven o'clock service. It was an exciting time. It was a vindication of this man who had been ridiculed and mocked and sneered at and had been made little of by the great and not the good. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. There was a parade organized to celebrate the opening of his church. I just was there, <laughs> like all the rest of the young loyalists. Uh, you you uh, go through the grapevine. And uh, the army had said, well, you're not doing that. So we said, oh, yes, we are. And the army came out with the gas mask and the rifles and the old adage, and they went, oh, well, sure, they'll not stop us. Everyone, When we started to move off, that was it. The army just put a lane across in the barbed wire and just fired the cars, canisters at us. Once we started swallowing the CS cars, we realised we weren't as big as what we thought we were. It's nasty. It's nasty. And that was the first time I ever tasted CS gas. I think the army won the day. <laughs> that was good singing. Let's keep it up on the second verse. 
When Ian established his church, it was a great draw, and a lot of younger people would have gone there to hear Ian preach. What is at stake tonight is our very heritage and the constitution of our land. Make no mistake about it. But also, they were attracted by the fact that he could link his scriptural message to the political message of the day. Because of the apathy and the lying and the deceit of the government at Stormont, we are breeding a monster in our midst which someday will be uncontrollable. Terence O'Neill's resignation led to a by-election for his seat in Stormont. This was Ian Paisley's opportunity to take on the Ulster Unionist Party at the polls. Uh, well, listen, sweetheart, I can't be long because Daddy's rushing now. At the core of the campaign was Eileen, meticulous in the organisation of her husband's crusade into government. Push all the cars out now. Every one of them, don't have one sitting around. Hello there. How are you? You get your votes in. The Paisleys toured the constituency, appealing to Ian's unique fan base. Well, you know the story of Ian Paisley and the Queen and the Pope were in the helicopter. And you know when the, the Pope flew over the Vatican, he threw out some holy water and said, that'll please my people. And when the Queen flew over Buckingham Palace, she threw out a Union Jack and she says, that'll please my people. And when the plane came over Ulster, I threw out the Pope and I said, that'll please the whole <laughs> I was in primary school and I had two chums who sat with me. One was a farmer's son, the other was working class loyalist and Church of Ireland. And the two of them came into class one day and they were carrying Paisley posters. Vote Paisley. Vote Paisley. Hello. 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 It was Dr. Paisley's ability to create this political shotgun marriage between Christian fundamentalists and working class loyalists. The ordinary individual listens to me, hears what I've going to say, and makes up his mind whether he'll vote for me or not. And that is his business. And if I have been successful in convincing him I'm right, then I have succeeded because I believe that God has helped me so to do. Ian Richard Kyle Paisley, 7,981. No longer the outsider, Ian Paisley won almost 50% of the vote in Terence O'Neill's former constituency, becoming an elected representative to the Northern Ireland Parliament. I thought this is the moment when unionism under Ian Paisley really takes off. Tonight, the truth and the cause for which I stand has had a glorious triumph. Paisley had the mandate to take the next step in his mission, the creation of a new political party, the Democratic Unionist Party, the populist alternative to the Ulster Unionists. Reverend Ian Paisley, Democratic Unionist MP at Stormont and Westminster. Mr. Paisley. General man, I am an Ulster Protestant and a Democratic Unionist. My province is overrun by the IRA gunman and is dark shadowed by bombings, burnings and murders. In the name of the loyalists for whom I speak, I repudiate the right of any Southern politician to have a say in Ulster's affairs. Ulster's affairs must be settled by Ulster men and Ulster women in a United Kingdom context and not in a United Ireland context. As the troubles escalated, paramilitary groups grew in size and influence. While the British Army began playing a more active, often controversial role on the streets. 
we were hearing reports every single day of an atrocity. They had a society that was heading to the brink of civil war. Something had to be done. Seeking a resolution to the conflict, British and Irish leaders met in Sunningdale to negotiate a new political structure for Northern Ireland. In a radical agreement, unionists and nationalists would share power in Stormont for the first time. For Paisley, this was betrayal. And let me tell you this, go down and photograph the bonnets of the British Army, a thousand army men. And if that, sir, is the sort of thing you think you'll get democracy in Northern Ireland, get you back to England. And I see the behaviour of these people, led by the demon doctor that preaches God knows what round the country. It's time it's got to stop. Paisley was at the back pushing against any move towards reconciliation or reform, any change that would help towards equality for nationalists. There was no grey area in any of this. I mean, Republicans and nationalists were the enemy. Sunningdale was anathema to us. Simply wouldn't, we wouldn't accept it. Taking to the streets, Paisley used his populist instincts to harness the power of his working class supporters. We are opposed to a united Ireland. We will not have a united Ireland. We'll have no dictators from Dublin coming up here to tell us what to do. And I say to the Dublin government, if they don't behave themselves in the south, it will be shots across the border. Set on toppling the power-sharing government, Paisley formed an anti-agreement alliance with several like-minded politicians, the Ulster Workers' Council and Loyalist paramilitaries. Together they initiated a strike, bringing the country to a standstill. Any government that says it refuses to heed the majority wishes of the people is setting itself on a disaster course. They're not prepared to consult, they're going to have confrontation. Factories and the crucial shipyards of Harland and Wolfe remain closed. They are the largest employers in Ulster. In the city of Belfast, nearly all commercial life has ground to a halt. Most shops, offices and stores are closed. Within a number of days, the strike began to bite. Oil and petrol supplies are to be stopped, save for essential services, will reduce the traffic trickle to almost nothing. As gas and electricity were cut off, the people cooked on coal fires. There were grim days. My personal memory is of an endless supply of tins of dairy custard, and we survived on that for, for quite a number of days. My wife, she was my girlfriend then, I kept saying to her, but this is the struggle. We've got to stand our ground, eat the custard, and we'll be, we'll be fine at the end of it. The paramilitaries embarked on a sinister campaign of intimidation and widespread disruption to enforce the industrial shutdown. Surrenders for people, because they knocked the power off and they had control of the power stations. Nobody could move. There was a sense of this could be it. This could be the climax of the struggle of the, of the battle. I was 18 at the time of the Ulster Workers' Strike, so I was doing my A-levels. My history teacher said to us, because our classroom was below sea level, that in a week's time, we would either be doing our A-levels or else there was a danger that the school would be covered in sewage. It felt like a society on the window ledge. Bombs planted by loyalist paramilitaries across the border in Dublin and Monaghan killed 33 people and injured nearly 300. We didn't know what was going to happen. This was a mass uprising by a unionist 
uh, people. Pressure increased on the Northern Irish government to act. We happen to believe in a great principle, civil and religious liberty for all men. I'm not aware that the people who are running this uh, strike are in fact elected members of our assembly. If they are, they have a very heavy responsibility on their shoulders to bring it to an end and quickly. Well, I think it's fair to say elected members are closely involved with it. Well, I think if that is the case, that those elected members, and let them be named, are using the wages of the men and women of Ulster for their own political ends, and it's a disgrace. And you don't quit, we will destroy you! There was a vast demonstration outside Stormont by farmers who had come to show the politicians their support for the loyalist strike. About 2,000 of them blocked the road to Parliament with tractors and muck spreaders and gathered on the steps to listen to politicians like Mr Ian Paisley who have championed their cause. The English and the Welsh politicians, I say to them today, if you are not prepared to govern Northern Ireland like any other part of the United Kingdom. Then let the Ulster people do the job for themselves. On May the 28th, the Loyalists won as the power-sharing executive collapsed, and with it fell the hopes of many for peace in Ulster. The Sunningdale Agreement was finished. When the executive collapsed, I was in a little shop, and there was several wee women who were jumping up and down with excitement, and uh, yes, and I thought, well, we've done it. It may be an unkind comparison, but events of the past few weeks certainly suggest that the political virtues of consensus, conciliation and compromise are imperfectly understood here. This wasn't just a government that was being brought down. This was a democracy that was being brought down. The collapse of Sunningdale for Paisley was an extraordinary moment. He had the wind in his sails. And my goodness, after Sunningdale, he felt real power. The strike proved no agreement could survive without Paisley's support. He had become a kingmaker. But was that enough for this rabble-rousing preacher? I believed that Dr. Paisley will not be happy until he's king of Ulster.